Okay, uh, thank you for being here. This is a high quality audio panel. So if you, if you really only care about low quality music, then you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong place. Um, we have some great panelists here today, and we're going to have a debate and discussion about different aspects um, of high-res music, better audio quality, better sound, and uh, I've got a great group of panelists. So I'd like just I'd like you guys to each introduce yourselves and a little bit about what your company is doing, what their approach is for the better for to create better quality sound. Shall I start? Okay, my name is uh, Alberto Ayala, and I'm a business uh, responsible for the video and sound uh, business in Europe for Sony Electronics. So anything to do with devices, you can see them downstairs. Uh, I'm, I'm the responsible for the European market. And I'm Paul Breitlin. I come from Tidal, a stream music streaming service that does care about the sound. Uh, and uh, I'm doing strategic partnerships there with anything Anything we can put the title into that will actually stream it. Uh, anything from Sonos, Harman Denon, and up to all the expensive pedigree brands, that's my job. Yes, uh, uh, my name is Norman Chesky, and I'm the co-founder of HD Tracks. And we're the largest high-res downloading store in the world. We started in the US in 2008. We have deals with all, all the major labels uh, and the large independents. And we just recently opened up in Europe and uh, in the UK and in Germany as well. I'm Spencer Chrislew. Uh, I'm with uh, MQA, formerly with Meridian MQA. We have uh, just split off on our own, basically as a startup. Uh, it's a company form that is all about the highest resolution audio in a convenient package that drops in today's environment. And we're, we're very excited about this and working with a lot of guys up here to make this a reality. My name is uh, Gare Skoden. I lead the corporate business development and digital media teams for DTS. DTS is a audio format uh, for immersive high resolution audio in film, games, and music. I'm very excited to participate in this and see the increasing interest in high resolution music among the professional community as well as consumers in general. Hi, my name's Simon Wheeler. I'm the Director of Digital and New Business at the Beggars Group of Labels based out of London and New York. Uh, we're record labels. Our artists make the music which goes to power all the services and the technology which all these chaps are talking about. And um, what, we'd, what we'd like to do is, is dive into some of the different aspects of delivering better quality sound. And one of the one of the hazards of of this discussion is there are often a lot of acronyms. There are different different um, interpretations of what is high quality and what isn't high quality. There's MP3s, there's FLAC, and I wanted to ask Spencer to just give us a little bit of a primer, a very very high level of what some of these acronyms and some what some of this is. Yeah, well, we we're all familiar with. CD and how the CD came about and um, just familiar with that format. It was a very popular format, one of the most popular formats ever in consumer electronics. CD has a certain amount of resolution and actually from the dawn of CD people have said that it, it was really nice and really convenient but it didn't quite sound as good or sound the same even as their vinyl records. And why was this? It, it actually has a lot to do with the resolution and the way CD is made. So if you think the way digital audio happens is that if an analog signal is coming in, what digital audio does is it actually takes a picture of the signal as it comes in and it assigns it a number. And the, the amount of numbers you have is equivalent to what is called a bit depth, okay? And CD had 16 bits worth of numbers that you could assign to it. So two to the 16th, I forget what the number is, 65,000 some odd numbers. The Sampling rate was something that allowed you to capture all the frequency information. And this is what defines CD quality. So CD, you took 44,000 pictures every second, and you assigned them one of these numbers in 16-bit. And as all of the, all the people on this panel, and many who've been dealing in high resolution, as I have my entire career, know that, again, there wasn't something all the way right. So one of the ways that we in the industry went about solving this was we added more, more bits. 
and we went to 24 bits. And what that did is it gave more numbers to assign better resolution, especially for low volume, very sensitive, quiet material. But that still wasn't quite enough. So we've doubled the amount of pictures, the sampling rate, up to twice what CD is and a little bit beyond that, and then doubled it again. So when we talk about high resolution, it's anything above this idea of CD at 44 and 16. And, and these things actually can be defined by basically the size of the channel that they take. So if you think of 44, 16 like this, 44, 24 like this, 96K which, or 88, which doubled that, and then 192, which doubled that again. And this is, these are the files that we're talking about. This is the resolution that's there. And the science is there that shows that this resolution actually makes a difference. The science is there that shows that people can hear the difference and that it, it is intrinsic in the way we understand music. And some of the technologies that we're going to discuss uh, are about preserving that information and making it available for the first time to everyone uh, in a way that's convenient, the way that everyone understands. And the obviously the MP3 or the 96K MP3, the really compressed files, are a fraction of that. And so we're we're now in a we're now in a fairly evolved state in the digital music industry. There's a lot of discussion around audio quality. There's a lot of debate about whether it is scientific or whether it's uh, perceived value and. Um, and I think the first thing to talk about is, is does it matter? And, well, and, and, and is there a scientific difference, or is it something that is more of a concept? Well, to that point, yeah, I didn't even mention it. When we talk about MP3s and some of what are called lossy formats, the reason they're lossy is because it actually throws away 90% of the information that's in the file. If you think about that, that's what an MP3 does. And worse than that, the noise that it introduces actually travels along with the music, which creates a really nasty distortion that's in it. It's designed so that, that those distortions are hidden. They're hidden in areas where we're not very sensitive to music, but that doesn't mean we don't perceive them. And so it's one of the things, again, because the environment is there to present everyone the highest resolution music, that we're all about that. And so obviously, the people in the industry who are here you know, building a business around making better quality sound believe that. But what about the artists? What about the consumers, millennials? Let's, you know, Simon, talk a little bit about the artist and the label perspective. What, uh, what's, your, what's your view? Well, I think from a label's perspective, we see a lot of value in uh, being able to deliver higher quality music experience and not just financial value. I think the experiential value of people to be able to experience that. Uh, it is a bit early in the day. I think up until you know, up until now even, I think you need some you know pretty, pretty decent, uh, a pretty decent setup to be able to really experience higher quality audio in the best possible way. And I think one of the down downsides of the, the perception of high quality audio is that it's been put in this audio files category. You know, you need to have a a, a twenty thousand pound stereo setup before you can really experience it, which which isn't quite true. But I think that's kind of where it's been perceived. So, I think it's seen as you know still a very much niche product. It's very early in the day now. I, I think from uh, in, if we think about making our repertoire available, if we need to go back to analog masters to be able to originate. Um, higher quality digital files, which, which is in the very large amount of cases what we need to do. The cost of sourcing, well going back, sourcing the original analog masters, being able to take them to a, to a quality mastering house, being able to create those new digital masters is not insignificant. Um, we are talking, you know, definitely a thousand, few thousand pounds per album master, if you want to do this properly. Now, with the market as nascent as it is, you know, do we go back through our catalogue of however many, maybe it's 500 albums, 700 albums, 1,000 albums, whatever the size of your catalogue is, and pay that money to invest for the future now? Uh, what, you know, at what point do we do this? It, do, it, it doesn't make sense for us to do the entire catalogue now, so we've got a programme of going through the, the masters, we are remastering, we are, we are originating, we're making sure they are true high quality masters. The, the worst thing any of the industry can do is try and take something which is substandard and either you know, upscale the masters to meet the quality or, or to basically tweak it or try and fake it. Um, so we're, 
we are pretty obsessed with not doing that. However, we've got to manage the, the cash and the funds to be able to invest in this. And we're not going to go and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds tomorrow when the business is only worth hundreds of pounds today. So, so, so that's our sort of like label perspective. I like to interject. Is this on? Yeah. Um, there's no question that to make high-res work, you need the commitment of the labels. And it's a business and people have to make money. You have to be able to monetize your catalogs. And, you know, but all things, you know, I believe all ships rise with the tide. And, you know, when we started HD Tracks, we launched in 2008, you know, a lot of people thought we were crazy. People never believed that people would, you know, pay a premium price for a download. And um, the majors and a lot of people were skeptical. But I'm pleased to say that now in 2015, um, we have every major committed uh, the three major labels, a lot of the independents, and I think that they're seeing enough revenue. They're starting to see significant revenue that they're all making a commitment to jumping into this space. And I believe all ships rise with the tide because first you have to get the labels. It has to start with the labels and get their commitment to offer you the catalogs. And then you need people like Sony to step in and start making players so people could listen to. So it's like a whole ecosystem. But I'm pretty excited because I think it has to start from the top down. And I think that we are showing the industry that there is money to be made in this area. And there's a lot of great artists now that are offering their catalogs. Uh, uh, Tom Petty just came out and offered. But there's so many at this point. And every day it's opening up more and more. So I think we're at a good place right now. And people do pay quite a premium. Right? Uh, they do, yes. Can you uh, talk a bit, a, bit, a bit about your what, what prices your, an album is well, retailing Well, we, uh, you know, we have a different kind of model. With HD tracks, we, we go after collectors, and it's more about we, we try not to sell tracks. We like to give people the experience. I kind of feel like when Led Zeppelin was making their record, they weren't thinking about selling it by tracks. And we do offer, um, you can get a 96 download for $17.98. That's the American price. And we could go up to $192. i am not trying to bore people with bit rates here. But what, I, what we've discovered, at least in our space, that consumers, the ones that are committed to this right now at the top, they're willing to pay the highest. They want the best file possible. And a matter of fact, I would say that when we come out with a, a new release, 65% of that, the sales are targeted at the top price point. Now, I'm not saying that that's for everybody, but certainly the, the, the core market, they recognize the difference and they're willing to pay for that. And Talk a little, you know, t tell us a little bit about Tidal, and you, because you've got you've got two two tiers, right? We got two tiers, and one one is lossy, and it's the same as Spotify and the others, and then we have a tier above that that's going back. Uh, we think right now the major leap. If you look at the world's catalog of music, ninety five percent of that catalog is the best available is CDs. I mean, it, it's been a format that's been around for a long time, and it's viable. It's like, it's good sounding. So the major leap is getting back to CD quality for most people. I think, I think Norman is a very different type of uh, of consumer than we have. We have a lot of like music enthusiasts, music people, people that want to get back in. I think you have a lot of collectors or the collecting people, and they're extremely obsessed with. I, I mean, we normally call them audiophiles. I hate that term, but they're, I, I know we they're call them music aficionados. They are music aficionados, yes, and and but we. It, in order to make high resolution or high quality or what was created in the mastering suite to the to the big public, I think uh, streaming it and streaming it as uh, right now it's CD quality. Uh, we will stream higher when that's viable. Um, so so, but but our approach is making that important leap back up to CD quality. Um, and be because I mean I, I mean Lossy was created to overcome the boundaries of a small modem that was sitting in a corner and dialing into the internet. And now we are streaming Netflix HD on iPads. And why should we not go back up to, to lossless streaming on music? I mean, it does matter. Um, one thing is the science of, of the files. It is better. You can feel the difference. Uh, but also, I mean, it's an experience. Yep. And it does matter. We, 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 need, we are the ambassadors for taking this back to the right level. Uh, and it's important. And we're very excited at MQA about it coming out of this niche. 
Um, Norman's played, and, and HD Tracks has played an incredibly important role in introducing high res to everybody. What MQA is about is taking that resolution of the highest resolution files and actually folding it losslessly into a package that's no bigger than CD, which means it can now stream on Paul's service. So the, the, the resolution that is now available to everyone, the cost of entry is no more than entering that tier that they're doing. So it doesn't cost any more in hardware. It doesn't cost any more other than that entry. The, the resolution is there. And I think by presenting the best possible resolution to everyone, I think we have a responsibility as a, as a music business to present what the artist created in the best possible way. And, and we had been limited by any number of technologies before, and I think for the first time in the history of recorded music, we can now present exactly what the artist heard bit for bit in the studio. Uh, and our technology will actually allow you to verify it, to actually understand, it will light an indicator that will tell you that this is exactly bit for bit what they heard in the studio. In a, in, a, in a package that can live on a streaming service or in a download service and can be played back on hardware for many of the guys up here. Well, it's, it seems like it's a proposition that starts at the artist. And someone said it starts at the label, but it seems like it goes further than that, that it really starts with the artist and what the artist perceived as their work in the studio all the way down to the consumer. Um, we are in a we are in a situation where we have probably probably everyone has some mix of all sorts of different quality files that are on various devices. Um, I would imagine that those of you who are working on platforms and codecs and and devices want this to be as as mainstream as possible. Um, so, what do you think it will take to go from being a niche and a collector and and a, you know a a, a a nascent industry and initiative to mass market? Yeah. Uh, so, I think uh, from our point of view, as as a provider of a high quality format, we've seen uh, you know our position in the consumer market grow over the last ten years to be from just hi-fi systems to TVs, cars, phones. So, I think. What Norman was alluding to, the fact that the ecosystem is, is rising is, is very promising because I think the core of the issue has been for a long time that there was a perceived and, a, and at times a real trade-off between being getting access to a high-quality file and a, not, and a low-quality file. So I think what you're seeing uh, with the, the next generation smartphones as well as other connected devices is that this audio capability is being built in already. So then the trade-off so that people that um, uh, Simon is working with actually will have a market that's vital. And I think in that sense, there's no question in my mind when you give uh, a, a consumer the ability to listen to their favorite artist in full resolution, give them a true immersive experience, that's a true wow. And they will hear the difference. And I think the premium models um, that Title is driving as well as Norman on the purchase basis Will will uh, will thrive in that environment, and I think with that, the artist community and the labels will will find the economics to to produce higher higher resolution recordings. Well, from from my side, uh, back to your point and assignment before as well, I have to say that uh, from from manufacturer's point of view, uh, device manufacturer's point of view, what we are trying to do is to help as well at the end of this kind of value chain, to basically democratize a bit the access to this uh, kind of experience. Uh, Simon was talking about the $20,000 or 20,000 pounds type of devices. We are trying, obviously, to bring this into, into mass market. So each one of these guys are trying to help their bit into making it easier for the consumer. And from our side as well, we are trying to uh, basically increase the number of models that we have available. We have more than 40 uh, models available in Sony uh, that play high resolution audio formats any kind of format. And, uh, and more than that, the average uh, selling price of the devices are coming dramatically to really hit this kind of mainstream consumer, not only the music aficionados or the audio files that we used to call them as well, but really just casual music lovers as well. But I, I think in the marketing of, of this, I mean, it's called, I don't know how many high resolution debates I've been in. And, then, and always, I think, the conversation with the consumer is hijacked by audiophiles. Uh, only wanted speaking about numbers, only want to just like up everything all the time. And it's, 
increasingly important that the, the story is that it's an unbroken chain between the mastering suite and what you're hearing. And if, if we could, if there was a price point out there that we could say, I don't, I, I don't want to even make that choice. We're just going to serve you a very, very good source file of a very, very good recording of a fantastic track. And you go, wow because it's a great music experience. So you don't have to deal with this. I am, I'm even reluctant to speak about high resolution uh, because it's, it's a te well, it, it starts to become technical and people will shut off. Okay, I, I just want to throw in one other thing. For people that are listening and trying to get the whole message, we're like in our infancy stage. And um, one thing I want to point out for you guys that make records out there that are in this business to make a living, if you look at the trends, last year downloading, you know, iTunes, the revenue's going down. Obviously, it's being taken up by streaming. But the high res market with downloads, I can only tell you that our company is still growing. And we haven't taken a turn. So with everything going on in the space, we're still every month generating new consumers thanks to people jumping into the space. And I think that's an important message I want to say because we're kind of like we're on the cusp right now. It's starting to just people are starting to talk about it. And I can only tell you from a monetization point of view, we're on an uptick, which means this is going to be more of a commitment to the labels, by the labels, more catalogs, more artists are jumping in. I think if you go to our, just our, you know, I'm not trying to sell my company HD, but if you go there, I think you'll be surprised by how many titles we have in high res right now, how many artists have committed in the labels. So, it's all like on the uptick. Yeah. I think j j just to add one thing about you know, consumers, they don't care about numbers, they do care about something which is quality. Uh, and I think even amongst us, we're calling it HD audio, we're calling it high res, we're calling it high quality, we're calling it 2496. I mean, that's between us, I mean, the consumers, God knows yeah. how they feel And, and look it. at us, it's, <laughs> it's men. <laughs> men in the middle of their lives. <laughs> It's a, it's a sad thing. I mean, even, even the, in the constellation of this panel makes it sad, right? I'm only 24 years old. I don't know my life. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think, though, we, we do have ourselves to blame, I think, for, for the communication message. I think two things. Although we're a big believer in standard, I think, collectively, we should, the numbers do matter, and we should always advocate for accuracy around what the resolution is on the professional side. But when you talk to the broader audience, uh, you've got to be much more future-centric and sell the promise of the future rather than focusing on our gaps. And then secondly, uh, it's all about the experience. And I think, uh, as we talked earlier, you know, the, the TV industry is doing a really good job of, of continuously pushing the future as a promise for people to make transactional decisions around TVs. When you think about 4K, is so they more broadly marketed around the world. The reality is there's really no 4K movie you can actually watch today. Now it is coming as secure media formats become more broadly available. But the, the whole point is, similar with, with our discussion, high res is coming. It is the experience you want. It is the awesome way to enjoy music. And if you're looking to buy a service, a file, or an equipment, you should consider that because you want to have that for years. And that's, that's all about the future. And it's, and it's about the music. And that's actually why we're all here at this conference is because it's about the music. And the thing about high resolution or anything you want to call high resolution is that it becomes an immersive musical experience again. That the, the studies have shown and, and the trends are out there that when listening to lossy formats, people lose their attention very quickly. Now, th anyone can attribute this to any number of sociological things, but we truly believe that it, a lot of it has to do with the underlying technology and some of the things that are actually very fatiguing to listen to. To be part of a musical experience, you have a whole generation of people who've actually not been exposed to what their artist intended, to what really all the nuances that go into an artistic performance that get lost in these other formats. The time is now and it's there and it's available to everyone and it drops right in and it can be the, and it, I think it's the experience that raises the tide. It's that experience, that immersive experience where everyone can listen into the music again and just lose themselves that is going to be very, very uh, important to all of it. I do think that you're right about the image of this and that 
you know, I always think of, you know, the, the immersive listening room as, you know, the 1970s, and now that's translated into the man cave with the big stereo speakers and this, this complete immersive listening experience. Whereas now we're in a very different era, and there's millennials and the next generation of music consumers. And do you, what, what do you think about whether millennials care? I think a very interesting trend is vinyl. Everyone thinks that vinyl and streaming are competitors, but uh, they go very much hand in hand because you cannot carry your record player with you everywhere. But we see a lot of female millennials. They don't even have a record player, they buy vinyl. <laughs> Uh, it's an identity thing. It's a physical format, which some of them haven't even experienced before a physical format because they've all been dealing with MP3s. Uh, but interestingly enough, we introduced the, the premium 999 tier. We had the 1999 lossless tier with title in the US and, and North America. Uh, our sister service in Scandinavia had both for a long time. So, but, but when we reintroduced the premium in the US, we expected a lot of people, young people, signing up to the premium service and not the high tier. And funny enough, we see a lot of them wanting to, they're asking their moms and dad if they can have title all by a sudden. And, and dad says, yes, you can have that. We can give you the premium. They say, no, 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 I want the expensive one. So there is something about millennials. They want to attach their identity to something good or expensive, I don't know what it is, but, but certainly there is a willingness to pay or, or a desire to have that good. Um, so mixed with a freemium world, there's also, they want the good stuff. Yeah, I also think uh, the millenniums, I think is a big part of the promise in my view, because I think more than any other generation, they probably consume more music than anyone ever did. They also, uh, I think to a large extent, uh, are getting used to wearing headphones, which by definition is an engaged experience, so you'll be able to hear the difference uh, versus using music as a background format. So the, the part that uh, we need to continue to work on is to get the message out that there's a better experience and uh, um, remove the convenience barrier, because I think when you look at their overall behavior, they probably pay more for online media in different forms of games and uh, and app-type based economic models than any other generation. We just need to channel that back to paying for something they really care about, which is the artists they want to connect with and really having the most immersive, uh, awesome experience with, with those artists. Uh, I was going to make the point about the headphones, good point, because when we talk about uh, high quality, you always think about the kind of home devices, the static devices, the living room or the, or the uh, listening room. but. We talk about millennials. We're talking about the, the boom of the headphone market in the last few years. And yeah, it has been driven by uh, marketing campaigns, not so much caring about maybe audio quality by the market or the brand that has been kind of uh, driving this growth. But in reality, if we can provide for that kind of product that is relevant to these millennials, this kind of sound quality, then we can grab this generation as well. So don't go there with a expensive uh, standalone uh, front speaker maybe but approach them with a very high quality fancy good design uh, headphones well, well i think that's exactly what we've seen and i think you reference you know marketing campaigns as opposed to quality but actually that marketing campaign was telling people this is something it's going to sound better you're buying into something which is going to make your music sound better now whether they do, whether they don't, that's what people are buying into. But I think it did prove that people will put money down, will put more money down because they're buying into a high quality experience. Exactly. I think that alone should give us all a lot of confidence. But it took a huge amount of marketing, some great branding, all of those things pushed together, delivered this, you know, quite a successful business. You know, I just like to add one thing when I say all ship tries. Like Tidal has come out with a better quality streaming service for better quality and you can, and my point is that I've had people contact us saying well I subscribe to Tidal and I hear a difference and I was so enamored by that that now I want to you know 
buy things from your site as well. They may stream title and then they have a favorite record and they actually want to even go higher. So it's kind of all feeds off each other. The fact that they're, they're, they're our favorite customers. Huh? <laughs> I love those customers too. I think the average consumer, I, I've seen some studies that shows that the average consumer does not trust that they themselves will be able to perceive a difference in quality. And so I do feel like getting artist messaging, I think what Neil Young has done, I think that what um, Dre did within Beats, I think those are really important messages because the, you know, the average person doesn't know the, whether or not they're going to perceive that value and that difference, but if it's coming from an artist, if it's coming from someone that, that created the music, that seems to be a really resonating factor. I couldn't agree more. It really has to start on that level. Um, I don't know if you guys, how many are from America, but she referenced uh, Pono, Neil Young, uh, a well-known rock star has been talking about sound quality for a long time, and he launched this company. And uh, it did get a lot of people start talking about the space. Also, in the United States, we have the Recording Academy, and uh, they have the P&E wing, Producers and Engineer wing, with thousands of people. And I know they're taking an initiative to start talking about high-resolution music to get people to go back so they could start remastering and putting things out. So it has to start on that level. And again, with artists, like I'm saying, uh, I think uh, more and more are talking about it. I'm very excited. Like, say, Tom Petty just came out, and he did a whole video. You could, you could Google it where he's talking about high res and how excited he was to bring his catalog out there. So that's how it starts. And every day, more and more people are stepping up to the plate. Yeah, and, and I think you're right when you say that, in a way, people have been trained not to trust their hearing. And yet, when it is presented to them, the, uh, especially young kids, go nuts. They, they're the, literally the reaction, the eyes just, I've never heard anything like that. I had no idea all that was in there. I had, I'm hearing instruments I didn't know were part of the mix. These things become very exciting. You're right, the, the message needs to be there as well. But I think in a way, it, again, it's a responsibility of all of us to make sure that people do understand it does make a difference. It is in there and it is the thing that our artists work on tirelessly, the, the, the amount of time and effort that gets put into making most records and the amount of time people spend on doing the subtle, subtlest little nuances because it matters to them, the artist, we can present. And, and it is something that really turns people on when they hear that little thing that they did. Why did they do that? What's gone on? It creates that engagement that I think is, is amazing. And again, if, if the technology doesn't get in the way, if the sound doesn't get in the way, then it's just that much more immersive. Yeah, I think uh, to add on to that, I think the, the artist, I think, has a key role in delivering the message to the user and the, and the consumer. Because if you look at the headphone trend, when that took off, it wasn't complicated about what type of headphone it was, really, or you know whether or not they had this or that driver in it. It was really all about the fact that, hey, this is a better experience. It's cool. you got to have it. And also, if you look at uh, you know, several other, other people here are doing presentations on how you make impact on social media and what drives behavior. Uh, the artist has a huge is a huge leverage point in that space and they have the ability to talk to the younger audience uh, today in a way that they had never had before. So getting them on board and being part of the process I think is key. I think Neil Young has done a good job as a service. I think that it's exciting that Tidal, uh, which has a high profile, high quality prof uh, positioning, is uh, artist owned. I think that will go a long way to raise awareness as well. So I think all these pieces uh, is uh, is uh, driving towards a promising future. But it's extremely hard to get the, the marketing message right because uh, yeah, ambassadors they're gonna they're gonna stand up there and talk about high res. They don't even really know what high res means, which then becomes a sort of a an authentic thing. I think the most important for them is that it's not been broken on the way to the listener. So uh, perhaps we should stop and think again how we market uh, higher than CD quality resolution presentation of that music. Because it, I think to engage the user, we need to find a better way to explain it. And uh, back in the old day, it was the DTS or the Dolby logo, and people go, oh, I'm sure this sounds OK. Uh, uh, and, and you're doing, trying to do that with the high res logo, but I'm, uh, frankly, I'm not so sure if it's the right logo. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, the thing is, and you can see it downstairs, um, yeah, we have a logo just to basically to allow consumers to identify a certain 
type of standard uh, that we are putting out there for consumers that are not knowledgeable about uh, what is or what kind of high quality music is out there right now. Uh, but coming back to the points that has been mentioned before as well several times in the discussion is about the artist. And right beside this logo, our motto is, as the artist truly intended. So if you like to kind of identify a product that you can see in the store by the logo and say like, ah, this is the one that provides probably an average better quality audio than the one that doesn't have the logo, and you relate to that, take it. If not, relate as well to the message that in the case Sony is trying to put out there, which is basically, we don't want to break the chain, the chain that you were talking about. We are trying to replicate exactly what the artists intended when they were in the recording studio. Yeah, well, now it's going to sound like I'm hostile to the to high resolution, which I'm not, because I, I am a big, I, I buy a lot of his files. Um, but uh, it is something there. When Beyonce went into the studio, she didn't intend to make something high resolution. She intended some music uh, in the best possible way. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical to the term. Uh, I, I, and every skeptical should have a better suggestion, but I don't. Uh, uh, so, but it's something about that getting back to that story is like, this is what we made in the studio. It's not been broken. Enjoy it. Yeah, and that, that actually is the message of MQA. And that actually is what MQA, the A in MQA stands for authenticated. So it's master quality authenticated. And like I said before, inside of the MQA file is a, is a signature from the artist that says, this is authentic. This is the art that I created. And it isn't about what number it was created at. It's saying, this is my art. And you are hearing it exactly as I intended. The same, the same low, we believe in that same phrase, exactly as the artist intended. And to present that to it, and in a way that's verified, and in a way that's authenticated all the way through the chain, uh, we think is very important. And, and we want to make it part of the ecosystem. Well, it is, and it, speaking about the ecosystem, it is very complex because you, you know, you have lots and lots of stakeholders in the chain, from the artist in the studio to the end consumer. And I think there is a little bit of fear associated with this: of Do I have to now buy new devices to play this back? Is this going to work if I download a file? Is it going to play from my iTunes? Do I have to have a different client? What kind of headphones do I need? You're all pretty deep in different stages of the ecosystem. Um, how how do you envision this? Is this a you know that the floor just rises and that it starts to become the new normal, of you know that CD quality or something is the is the minimum? Is that well? When I just think it's still a little bit too specialist, and I think you touched on it earlier on, and just in passing, is that you need the new range of things like smartphones to come out, and they got to support high quality audio, high definition audio, and people have can then create an ecosystem around it. People can in innovate around it. You're delivering the high quality audio, you're delivering a data feed with it, you can deliver metadata with the audio. You can give people a better experience. But it needs to be something you can just pull out of your pocket like that and plug something into and listen. You know, you don't want to fiddle around with it, or the, or the mass audience doesn't want to fiddle around it. It needs to come out of a data point and not out of an, you know, an analog point. And I think that's when it starts to get really interesting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I th I, we're kidding ourselves. The only thing the user ever is going to do when this, if this is going to take off, is to press play and have an awesome experience and associate it with, with, with what it was. Because I think um, the the deficiency, I think, is very real, and we know it's real because we work in the field. But most people today don't have a problem with music. You know, they're not walking around thinking, "Oh my God, you know, did my Spotify is." I just, I just can't listen to it anymore. It's, it just doesn't sound good enough. It's, it's, it sounds fine for most users in most use cases. But uh, for the, when they have the, um, a, a higher resolution experience and more immersive experience with something they love, they get the difference. So our job is to make that accessible across um, you know, all types of devices that are relevant for music playback and then support it with content so that when, when they're there to press play, that moment of magic happens. And I think that's the way you're going to turn everybody. That's the way the artist gets turned on things like MQA or DTS, HD Master Audio, or other high resolution formats as well, because they start hearing the difference. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. It, it can't be something where that is the message, the technology is the message, because it will get too complicated. But it's the job of everyone on this panel, and everyone is working 
to do just that, to make it so you just press play and it's an awesome experience. And whether it's because, you know, whether it, it helps that, it's, that, that they see that it's authenticated, we think that helps, but they may not. They may not care, just that they, they get to experience the music in that way. And the infrastructure is already there, as we've been saying multiple times. Our files drop right into Paul's streaming environment and they play master quality audio. They drop right into Norman's download environment and people can own that same thing. They play back on, on uh, Sony equipment, you know, with DTS, all of it works, you know. Um, so it's there right now, and it's, it is just a matter now of just making everyone in this room, everyone around of it, aware of what it is, and to start start creating the, the momentum around it. I just, so, want to, I just want to add, you mentioned the phones. Early this year, Sprint had a deal with Harman Kardon, and they are starting to make phones that play back high res, and I think you're going to see that this is... Uh, a start of a trend that's going to be, you're going to see more and more, and the phones are going to be able to play higher bit rates. So it's all moving in that direction, no question about it. Um, so when we think about the next one to two years, um, it'd be great to imagine that, that it, you know, at, at MEDAM in two years that we look back and we say, yeah, remember that? Remember for that 10 year period when we listened to 96K files? You know, that's, you know, isn't that funny? That's a part of our, our digital uh, ha past. Um, but we want to take some audience questions, but before that, I'd love to just hear from each of you where, where you see the, the next big innovation, where in the next one to two years you feel like the, all of this is going. Is, it, is, is the floor just going to, to rise on all of it, or will there, is this more of a uh, segmentation of the music consumer marketplace? Okay, five minutes start. Um, I think... Uh, the, as you said, the, the floor is going to raise, uh, the standard is going to raise uh, in the different stages of the, of the chain. Uh, I think the music services are going to raise or maintain, obviously, the, f the format that they have already. Um, from a manufacturer point of view, definitely it's going to be a, a more kind of affordability and a, a more variety of products available in the market. Uh, Norman was talking about the smartphones. In, in one year time, we know there are going to be more smartphones playing or capable of playing high res or high quality audio than, than non capable of playing high resolution, high resolution audio. So in that sense, uh, by default, consumers will see that the vast majority of the products out there will be capable of dealing with that kind of uh, quality. And once you have a product that is capable of, of, of delivering that kind of uh, uh, experience, you want to try it. You want to try it. And, and once you try it, as some of you guys said, uh, you are not coming back. For me, I think in the next 24 months, I think we're commoditizing high quality, which is a good thing. It's putting the right quality in the hands of a lot of people. I don't, they don't even have to make the standpoint. We've just launched, as an example, we've lo just launched a student program where you can get the high resolution or the high the CD quality tier at the same price as the, the regular premium, the Spotify, it's $9.99. Now for students, they can experience this at the same price. So I think we're trying to put this in the hands of the masses and, and hopefully in 24 months, they will take it for granted. It's the, it's the standard. So I, I think the, the big leap now is getting back to no loss in the, in the quality itself for most of the catalog and then it will just carry on climbing from there. So, so I, I think we'll... Uh, eventually take higher than CD quality also for granted, I hope, because it means we're not taking the, the quality for granted, but we're just enjoying the music. So, so I, I think uh, you'll, you'll see this settle as a standard, I think, in the next uh, two years. If you're asking me in two years if people look back, I, I think I could say with confidence that this is going to be a much larger market. I think that people in the music business are going to make more money from better quality streams and, and downloads, and, uh, and that's all good. I think Tidal's going to be a healthier company in two years than they are now. I think you're in the right direction. I think HD Tracks, based on everything going on in the space, is going to be a larger and more successful company than we are now. I think the labels will have, by then, when you're going to ask them about you know, high res, and they're all going to say we're very committed to it. And, 
I think it's all good. The other thing I want to point out that I think that excites me in, in America, when they come out big, with big releases now, whether it's a Mumford & Sons or whoever, uh, that on street date, they make it a point to offer a high-res version of that. So these are all good things. Everything's being put in the pipeline, and people are making the right commitments to make this a bigger industry. So I think in two years, we're going to be giving it a thumbs up. Same. Yeah, I think we are actually on the verge of a, of a real revolution in, in music and the way people really enjoy music. Um, there, was a, there was a quote by one journalist about MQA where he said, um, we really feel that uh, uh, MQA will make high, the term high resolution as anachronistic as digital camera. It'll be so ubiquitous that it, it will just be everywhere, that no one will be talking about what high resolution is. They will just be experiencing it. And that is what we're truly behind, and I'm, I'm, we're really excited about what the next two years look like. Yeah, I think, uh, as everyone has said, I think, I think the, the, the floor is rising, and I think uh, the artists are involved. And one of the things, I don't know if anyone here is Imagine Dragon fans, but we did the project with them on their new album, and when you go to their concerts, they're going on the world tour, I think, started in the United States. There is a uh, gallery that you can walk through and experience all the songs on headphones before the the concert starts, and the whole point there is to give people a full rest immersive experience. It was a way for the band to really try to educate their fans of what their intention was when they made the specific album. Um, I think the convergence of the devices being available, the technologies uh, simplifying the process so that it is really just a hit play is, is what we need. I think it always takes longer than you think, but uh, continue to work together as an industry and focus the message to the user on the experience of the future. Uh, I think it will be in a good shape. Yeah, for me, it's all about having enough affordable mainstream consumer devices in the marketplace, so that's just the norm. And then having enough services to provide the, provide the music in the right quality for people to enjoy on them. That's pretty simple for me. That's great. Um, we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions in the audience? Otherwise, we could just go on and on and on. And are you, are you? Hi, I think this is a question for Tidal. Um, are there talks with ISPs? Because there's, uh, if you stream high quality, there's a lot more data flowing around. And um, usually, well, it's in, in Germany anyway, you have a certain like data package per month. And if you go above that, you, you only have like low quality service after that. And I imagine that it goes away pretty quick if you use uh, premium, or the high quality streaming. Very good question. And there's two main paths to, to, the, to the answer. And one is, yes, we are talking the ISPs. There are companies like uh, T-Mobile offering uh, music freedom where the data for music and services are included. Uh, so yes, and then there's also, of course, the classic bundle talks and many other waves, uh, ways of, of engaging ISPs with music. The other um, uh, answer to that question is people talk an awful lot about streaming being streaming, but it's actually also distribution of files that can be offline to your handset. And we see a lot of offline use. I myself, I'm, I think most of the music I listen to, unless I'm checking out new stuff, is stuff that I've synced down to my, my. Uh, so we're also in the download business, but we, I mean, we're we don't. You're, you're not dealing with the files. You just flip, flip a switch. So so uh, so in that sense, a lot of people on on the go with mobile, in their car or commuting, or they are actually experiencing that music uh, locally from their device. Is there anyone else? I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about getting into the heads of millennials. I mean, these are people that grew up without CDs. They've just been listening to crappy music from the beginning. And you could make the argument pretty easily that they went to Beats headphones just for status more than quality of audio. So how do we ensure that they understand the message and that they get to actually experience that, um, you know? Uh, to, to me, that's the leap of faith that we've all uh, taken uh, by building a business around high quality. Because you know, if you have to explain it, then probably it won't happen. Because I think that's a that's a that's a 
uh, path that doesn't lead anywhere good. You have to just let them experience it. And I think it, it also inspires the creators when they know this, uh, this tool exists. I think you'll see more creative mixing. You'll see more creative use of dynamic range. A lot of things that got lost as things got mastered for radio or low, low bit rate, uh, low bit rate streaming will come back and there will be a difference. And if the young person cares about the artist, uh, uh, they, they, they don't need any explanation. It sounds awesome. It's all about the experience and that's it. I would just like to add and say that, you know, it is challenging to go after a generation that grew up and they don't really even believe in paying for music. So they have a different mindset. But I think it does call come down to the experience. Uh, it's like what Spence said before. It's like I know that when people would, like, let's say, download Michael Jackson's Thriller and you put somebody who only heard it on MP3 their whole life and they get a chance to hear a better experience and they're going to hear instruments and things that they didn't know existed in the recording, I think that does make a tremendous difference. It's almost like if you, if you have somebody who's been watching a black and white TV their whole life and then suddenly you put a plasma in front of them, I think they will... You know, they'll see the difference, and the point is we have to get these young people to hear the experience here. So I think that's the key is exposure. Uh, yeah, I agree. And, I mean, for a group of people, if, you, if they have a nice headset, mobile phone with enough battery on it and Wi-Fi, they're happy. And they don't want to... I mean, we're, we've been talking about this before that, I mean, the old collector generation, the baby boomers, they wanted to own their house, their car, everything. I mean, these guys, yeah, they want to Uber a car. And then they want to Airbnb their holiday place. They don't want to buy a second house. They just want to Airbnb it. So I think, obviously, I think streaming is sort of the part of that answer. Um, and then it comes as a music industry. It's about not, not starting to discount the quality tiers very hard, because I think we need to keep the price up. Now, now we see some of the people are starting to willing to pay, and they want to pay double premium and then it's all about like not discounting that but adding more and more and more value into that price by putting the quality up giving them more experiences giving them whatever they they like just now i mean if it's surround sound for your headphones or whatever we need to stick that in there to keep the price up and not discount you know some people i just want to say some people want to own some people want to rent what we don't want are squatters in the house. Which we, so we want to hopefully get young people to realize that there is you know, a reason to pay for music and that it's, they're supporting the artists and that's a good thing. From, from a manufacturer point of view as well, and taking your point about, uh, about the appeal of the device itself, um, if we have to bring these people on board through design, then let's do it. So, and, and I think in that sense, there's this, uh, you stay tuned uh, in the coming months. But the question is, if, if we have to bring them into experience that kind of new way of listening to music through a very cool device, or a very appealing device in terms of design, so be it. Any, any way to bring them on and to let them experience, because as I said before, once you, once you get them, then they will stay with that kind of quality. Uh, yeah. So design and the appeal of the product itself is very important for them to really this, this money that they have available for uh, basically um, purchasing certain iconic devices uh, to be audio, one of those devices. Okay. Well, one thing in, in your example that you got to keep in mind as well, so that young person who spent the headphone, spent that, uh, you know, $300 on headphones, spent more money on the headphone in some cases than they did for the phone. So if you think of that for a minute, so clearly sound matters to that person because the only use for the headphone is to play audio through it. The phone has a lot of a lot of other use functionality, so I think there's a great great untapped potential among that audience. And and I'm just going to reiterate in in uh, in a different kind of way than they've been saying. Music was actually invented by us, by humans, to actually please our senses. It is something that resonates with everyone, and you don't find anyone out there who says I don't like music. The reason it resonates is because it is part of that. And, and when you 
give people real music in a real space and a real experience, it sells itself. It, it doesn't have to be sold, and it's not about numbers and anything else. The music, the experience of the music is, is going to be amazing, and, and that is what will raise the, raise the level for everyone. Just going back to what you said about um, the conversion formats and, and the possible emergence of, um, of a converter actually built into the headphones, it, it just seems to me at this point in time that there's potentially a weak link with a mobile device, you know, with the average phone, that people are, you're saying there's a growth in the headphones market um, and people are buying into, you know, more and more expensive headphones and you guys are pushing for higher quality audio. But is there development with the mobile phone manufacturers to actually improve the converters? Or, or as you say, develop uh, converters in, in the headphones themselves and a, and a digital output? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that side so, of things. So you're talking about a DDA, the DDA converter in the phone, between the yeah. phone and the headphones? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you've okay. got that, you still got that link. Yes, sure. Yeah, so, so I think you make a great point. The experience is ultimately a function of the lowest common denominator in the whole chain which I think why we're all here and assemble with the diversity you have in terms of the different companies. But, uh, but I think the, the, the short answer to your question is yes. I think that's coming in a big way. And I would say in the next 24 months, which was what um, Vicky mentioned, I think you'll see a mid-range percentage of phones having that full capability, some smartphones. So it's 30 40%, and I'm sure Sony can speak to that eloquently along their own products, because I know they're very much part of that trend. Yeah, absolutely. We started already one year ago in uh, in uh, IFA when we presented the new range of Xperia phones. Uh, Set 3 has been one key uh, model pushing the high resolution audio and uh, any future kind of uh, key models that we will be launching will be obviously uh, prioritizing a high quality audio as well as one of the key selling points, yes. I, I mean, mobile phones sound a lot better than their reputation these days. They do. And also headphones have starting to become created to work well with a really, really low voltage coming out of the phone. So, I mean, they, you can have a fantastic experience with just headphones and a mobile phone. Yeah, I mean, I think you can find, you know, if you do a bit of a search online, there's enough news items in the specialist areas about developments that's going on for consumer electronics devices, trying to, trying to integrate proper high-definition audio at a, at a very accessible level for the mainstream and that's that's really what we need you know in my view until we get there it's not really going to take off but you know once it's built into the device which everyone's buying anyway then it's going to start to become that standard and that's definitely happening Hi, um, I hear a lot about uh, the word experience and experience and high quality and experience, but then when it comes to the real experience, which is the live music, uh, yet I still you know, don't find this type of panels talking about you know, the quality of sound and music during the live performance to the point that I think uh, Jer uh, referenced before, that we have to set up mobile station with headphones at the concert to let the people you know, hear the music in a high resolution uh, format. Pretty much saying, you're not gonna get that thing at the concert. Well, I mean, uh, I think the, the numbers actually bear out that people are going to more and more concerts and value live music more than ever before. If you're talking about just sound playback quality in large venues, that's actually a very, very difficult animal to manage. Um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not the easiest thing to, in the world to bring that, that the the best quality sound everywhere in a place that has to seat 30,000, 40,000 people. Um, to that end, there are some things that can be done. There are ways that, uh, that uh, you know, between limiters and processors and all sorts of technical details that we can go into uh, about what it is, but I know that the technology evolves everywhere and that, uh, and that the guys who are mixing live sound um, are very much involved in making it a, a better experience there as well. Yeah, so great, great point. But but the answer to your question is uh, is is yes, like Spencer was saying. That you know it is a very different experience. I think though the live experience have other social elements of connecting with the artist than than the purity of the art itself from from a studio recording. So I think those are complementary things, and I think that also uh, also 
uh, is a point that shows that the younger audience is spending a lot of money on music. They, you know, it's just that you got to make the consumption not free, uh, because when they are given a chance to buy what they perceive as premium, whether that's live or other way, other ways, uh, they're for their favorite artists. They spend their hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of dollars on an individual experience. Thank you very much, and uh, I think everyone will be here for a few minutes if you want to chat with any of the panelists, but really appreciate you coming by.